Until recently, Afghanistan has been an unknown country for most people. It took a world political crisis to put Afghanistan on the map and attract the attention of the international press and media. But despite being the focus of attention, interest has mainly centered on the country's role in world politics. There's been little concern for or interest in the life and culture of the people who inhabit this remote and varied land. This film is an attempt to present Afghanistan as we experienced it before the Russian intervention in 1979. Much of the way of life portrayed in the film has remained essentially unchanged for centuries. A journey in Afghanistan has a timeless quality, which is experienced as vividly in the remote valleys of the Hindu Kush as in the bustling markets of Tashkurgan. Afghanistan has always been on the crossroads between East and West. The trade routes from Europe to India and China pass through here, and Tashkurgan in the north of the country, close to the Russian border, has for centuries been an important trading post on the Silk Road to China. Because of its strategic position, the land of the Afghans has been disputed territory throughout history. It's only existed as a distinct political entity, as Afghanistan, for about 200 years. Until then, it had been at successive times a collection of petty states based on regional capitals, the center of the great Mughal Empire ruled by foreigners, and a dismembered country. The land has been fought over and ravaged by a succession of rulers and invaders, from Alexander the Great to Tamerlane. Islam established itself as the dominant religion by the 10th century, mercilessly crushing the Buddhist and Hindu influences which had prevailed previously and destroying a rich and flourishing heritage. In the 13th century, Genghis Khan led the Mongol hordes in an orgy of destruction in this land and raised its most beautiful cities to the ground. Amongst them, Balkh, known as the mother of cities and the jewel of Asia which was reduced to dust with all its inhabitants slain. This game of Buskashi was probably played by the Mongol horsemen in just the same way seven centuries ago as these Afghan tribesmen now play in the ruined city of Balk. Today, Buskashi is the national sport in Afghanistan. The aim of the game is to drag the bus, the headless carcass of a calf, around a distant flag and drop it in a small circle. The aim of the other players is to prevent you doing that by whatever means. It's a wild and dangerous game with frequent casualties amongst riders and horsemen alike. <laughs> The major colonial powers, particularly Britain and Russia, have always had an interest in Afghanistan's strategic position. Throughout the last century, the British struggled to keep a firm hold on this aggressive and rebellious people. But the Afghans pride themselves that they never fell under British colonial rule, like their neighbors India and Persia. They repeatedly drove the British out of the country, and until recently have always resisted Russian influence and preserved their independence. However, colonization would have been accompanied by an input of Western technology, 
and Afghanistan has remained notably poorer in economic terms and less industrialized than their neighbors to east and west. It's hard to appreciate what this means until, for example, you see men like these hewing stone out of the mountain in order to build a bridge or a road. In this enormous country, as big as Germany and France put together, there are only about 800 miles of tarred road. This is a single road running from east to west and north to south. And even this was built only in the last 20 years with American and Russian money and designed to further those countries' interests. For the most part, the roads in Afghanistan are just dirt tracks running across the desert or into the mountains of the Hindu Kush. But these are sufficient for the country's present needs, since outside the capital, cars are scarce and the only means of motorized transport is the occasional lorry or bus. Afghanistan is a vast, arid land of mountain and desert, largely unpopulated, and many of the tribes have traditionally lived a nomadic existence, disregarding national boundaries. Most of the Afghan people live from some form of agriculture, whether it be a settled existence in a small village or traveling the country as nomads with flocks of sheep or goats. Either way, it's a very poor life. Yet people seem to accept this traditional lifestyle and the type of progress the West would like to impose, industrialization, mechanization, the factory, all these would bring with them a fundamental change to people's lives, which would be alien and destructive to much of Afghan tradition and culture. Ten years, Kabul, as the capital of Afghanistan, has been at the center of a series of major political changes. The overthrow of the monarchy in 1974, and then the Soviet-backed revolution of Taraki in April 1978, 
allowed Russia to exert a stronger influence on Afghan affairs. This culminated in the military intervention of 1979. But Kabul is not Afghanistan. In this country with 13 million inhabitants, there are many different tribes, each with its own language and culture. And these tribes continue to exercise regional power. So political control of Kabul does not guarantee control of the entire country. And the red flags of Taraki's revolution, which adorned almost every public building when we were there, were hardly to be seen outside of the capital. About half a million people live in Kabul, and it's here that East and West rub shoulders. This is the only place where you might see an Afghan woman unveiled and in Western dress, where the foreign influence is strongly felt through aid and cultural programs, and of course through tourism. Kabul has become the center for Afghan intellectuals and reformers, but even they are treading dangerous ground when, for example, they try to abolish the chadari, the veil, or the bride price, or when they want to push through a literacy campaign or agrarian reform. These things are only acceptable when the religious and cultural principles of the people are not directly threatened. This is a place with totally different standards, different social norms, norms which are so foreign to us that when you don't know them, you're constantly in danger of upsetting people. On the whole, the Afghans are very understanding and courteous, especially to the foreign visitor. But that doesn't alter the fact that you're breaking their social codes. For example, to sit on the floor with the soles of your feet facing someone is extremely offensive. Chairs are not part of the Afghan lifestyle. In social situations, people sit cross-legged on a carpet. If there is no carpet, people will squat. And this squatting is not only comfortable, but it's also courteous because you're keeping your feet hidden. The streets of Kabul are always teeming with life, and for the foreign visitor, it's fascinating just to wander through the bazaar or stand and watch the many activities taking place on the pavements. But even here, you can cause offense without realizing it. To pay too much attention to a barber, for example, working by the roadside, is frowned upon because a barber deals with body hair and is of a very low status. In Kabul, there's a real mixture of traditional and 20th century lifestyle. Nomadic settlements and modern housing development stand side by side. The more modern residential areas of Kabul are mainly inhabited by the wealthier Afghans, Europeans and diplomats. Although modern, the large brick houses are surrounded by a high wall in the Afghan style, and the life on the street is still a traditional one, with peddlers and laden donkeys a common sight. A special example of urban development in Kabul is the housing estate of Makroyan, which was built with Russian aid in European style and planted on the plain outside the city. Makroyan is often quoted as an example of progress, but it remains a foreign import which hasn't grown out of the life of the city at all. Although Kabul does differ in so many respects from the rest of the country, it has a university, banks, large hospitals and schools, radio and television, the most important influence on the lives of people is still Islam. And even draping the mosques of Kabul with the red flags of the revolution can't diminish its power.
Normally, Kabul's colourful bazaar is open late into the evening, but nightlife in the cultural sense, as we in Europe understand it, simply does not exist here. You can't just go to the theatre or visit a performance of folk music at will. Although radio music is transmitted over loudspeakers all day long in the streets of Kabul, you hardly ever find a live performance. Folk music is an integral part of traditional celebrations, and as with all family and religious events, the foreigner, the non-believer, is generally excluded. Whilst we were filming in Kabul, there was a rather special music festival taking place, organized by the Goethe Institute, the Indian Embassy and Radio Afghanistan. The festival brought together the most famous groups from different parts of the country, some of whom had never been in Kabul before. It was a great event, spread over a period of six weeks, and the majority of the audience were Afghans. Even for them, it was a rare opportunity to hear music from other regions of the country. There's no one type of Afghan folk music. It's just as diverse as the ethnological makeup of the country. The different instruments used also reflect the variety of influences from the Indo-Arabic world. It's interesting that in a country where arranged marriages are the norm and women are rarely seen unveiled in public, that most of the traditional folk songs are variations on the theme of romantic love.
Since the revolution in 1978, there's been a new outlet for folk music as public performance. We discovered this when traveling through the country and being invited on one of our overnight stops to come to the village hall, where there would be women singing and dancing. You've got to remember that this is an Islamic society, where women are generally veiled from head to foot whenever they appear in public, which in any case is not very often. In country areas, even the shopping seemed to be done by men or children, so that we were always conscious of the absence of women. point of view as Westerners, Afghan women certainly seem to be oppressed by the country's religious and cultural traditions. Girls receive no type of formal education, and once they reach puberty, they're hidden from the eyes of everyone except the immediate family. However, Taraki's socialist regime was trying to bring about small changes in improving the position of women. They legislated to introduce schooling for girls as well as boys, and to abolish the bride price part of a tradition of arranged marriage by which a father will sell his daughter for a large sum of money. But laws passed in Kabul have little or no effect on life in small villages, and one of the ways that the government hoped to introduce new revolutionary ideas to people was through groups of performers such as this. But judging from the charged atmosphere at this performance, a woman appearing on stage unveiled before a male audience is more of a provocation than a symbol for change. Sometimes we drove for hours passing the occasional village, but these were generally closed off to the outside world. There was no bazaar or shop where we could buy food or provisions. We would have to wait till we found a market town like this one, Istalif, which serves as a trading center for the surrounding area. <laughs> In the back streets, many of the goods are produced which can be found on sale in the bazaar. Woven kalims, for example, rough and colorful rugs, are produced on primitive hand looms, which in the summer months are often situated outside in the shade of the house. On the whole, these looms are operated by young boys, because the adult working population are kept busy in trade or working in the fields.
these workshops, pans and plowshares are produced by an extraordinary smelting process, which has probably been unchanged for centuries. Molds are made out of damp, packed sand, and these are then buried underground. Scrap iron, mostly recycled car parts nowadays, is melted down in the furnace, and the molten metal is then poured into the underground molds. Each mold, so carefully constructed, can only be used once for making one pan, and so we were amazed to see that out of a batch of ten or so pans at any one time, only three or four will be perfect and good enough to sell. The rest are recycled in the furnace when this arduous process is repeated. These kind of workshops are generally family concerns, and the traditional skills are passed on from generation to generation. At first we were surprised to see so much of the village work being done by children. You rarely see children just playing around in the streets. They're generally involved in some task or household duty. Here you have to see childhood in a different context. Most of the population is illiterate, since in the past children have had little opportunity for schooling. Although this has become more of a possibility in recent years, it still can't be taken for granted. What this means is that survival is not linked to school education, but much more to the traditional idea of learning a skill or craft at home. So for children in Istalif, that means the loom at the side of the house, or the pottery workshop in the backyard, and they start on this work at a very early age. Yeah.
When traveling through Afghanistan, it's often very hard to find places to stay or to eat. There are few hotels and restaurants, and the only food you can buy is a kebab of mutton or goat meat with bread or tea. The kebabi, the owner of the kebab store, is a fairly prosperous man because meat is an expensive item. He and other tradesmen can afford to live comfortably compared to the mass of the population who farm the land. But that doesn't mean that they display their wealth in terms of fine clothing or consumer goods. They're just as likely as the next man to be without a pair of shoes and wearing a tattered jacket. But in a market town like this, the tradesman enjoys a high status. He is an important man in the community. Tea, or chai, is the staple drink of the Afghan people, and the tea house, the chai shop, is a favorite meeting place. Throughout the day, you will find groups of men sitting around drinking tea and talking, and this is an important and integral part of their social life. In general, the Afghan always has time for himself and for others. He's not tied to a nine-to-five routine as most people in the West are. Here, time has quite a different meaning, and it's the one thing that even the poorest man is master of.
تما بر دامن یاشت آها چادر بسرید گاچی یریر از جانم جانم چادر بسرید گاچی یریر از جانم جانم شوی سگ کیت قتیم بخیل از جانم جانم شوی سگ کیت قتیم بخیل از جانم جانم ای درد خدا چی لوا چاره کنم Traditionally, it was the custom of Afghan caravan drivers to adorn their camels with bunches of ribbon, tassels, fringes and all sorts of good luck charms before setting out on their hazardous journey across the desert. The idea was both to pay homage to their camels and to put them under the protection of Allah, 
because the spirits that inhabited the wilderness were believed to be evil. Today, this tradition has survived in the form of paintings and decorations on the Afghan lorry. For the lorry driver and his mate, their lorry will be their home for weeks or months in their hard and lonely life. And each lorry is painted and decorated in its own unique style. The center for lorry building in Afghanistan is the Lorry Bazaar in Kabul, where everything is done by hand, from the rebuilding of the lorry to the final painting. The chassis and motors and parts of the body are originally imported, but they are then worked on by a colony of carpenters, welders, mechanics and painters who build up the body, adding balconies and platforms, and finishing with colourful paintings and decorative touches until they've created a moving oasis of colour out of what was a pile of scrap. Scrap is a foreign word in Afghanistan. Nothing is ever thrown away. These lorries are rebuilt from wrecks time after time using recycled parts and materials. Just as the shoemaker at the side of the road will mend your shoes again and again, and when you finally throw them away, somebody else will give them a new life. Every tin can or bottle or paper bag has a value. Nothing is wasted. The paintings and decorations on the lorry serve several functions. Apart from placing the truck and its driver under God's protection, they're also like a comic strip for the people of the distant mountains with their images from traditional Afghan culture alongside contemporary Western pictures, idyllic mountain landscapes with scenes from modern urban Kabul. There's yet another reason for the elaborate adornment. Although lorries rarely carry advertising as such, the more colourful and decorative the paintings, the more clients the lorry owner will attract. The roads of Afghanistan are strewn with dangers, breakdowns, accidents, avalanches, floods, even bandits. The careful driver must know how to protect himself. And what merchant would entrust his goods, or what passenger entrust his life, to a driver who so patently neglected to place his lorry and his load under God's protection?
A journey through Afghanistan, like memory itself, is composed of passing images. As foreign visitors, you can never acquire a complete knowledge of another country and culture, especially not in a land as complex and remote as this. Recent events have highlighted the inevitability of change in Afghanistan, but it would be tragic if this proud and independent people were prevented from taking their past with them into the future.